Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And we're continuing with our series on the cults. And we're uh, now discussing uh, the Jehovah Witnesses. But I'm going to call them, refer to them as JWs, because uh, not because I'm trying to necessarily be disrespectful, <laughs> but just because I don't think that the, the JWs are truly Jehovah's Witnesses. I believe that the people on this panel are the true Jehovah's Witnesses. We're the ones that are really giving the true testimony about Jehovah God Almighty, who is Jesus Christ our Savior. So uh, we're going to talk about the JW's doctrines, their official doctrines, and then we're going to look into the scriptures and see if uh, the JW's uh, doctrines are biblical or not. But first, let's start by introducing the panelists, and I'll start, start here with, just say, introduce yourself, tell them, uh, the audience about your YouTube channel, and uh, then we'll move on. Uh, I'm Brother Austin. Thank you, Brother Luke. Uh, how is everybody doing? My name is Austin. My channel's name is uh, Austin Bell. I run an uh, online ministry called Crisis Ministries. Uh, this week, I wanted to apologize for uh, my absence. I've been working lately. Uh, God blessed me with a job. Finally, I've been praying on it a lot. And uh, I just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, my brothers and sisters out there in Jesus Christ for uh, upping my comments on that Google+, Plus, the new comment section on YouTube. Uh, we're all learning to cope with it. And uh, I've actually seen that it's, you know, when uh, you thumb up a certain comment on these, uh, it really picks up in it, you know, uh, I'm simple salvation gospel verses, and it's going through the roof. Uh, people are seeing it all over. And I think even better than previously before, so uh, aim into that. You're not helping me, you're helping the kingdom of God. All right, guys, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. I hope everybody will subscribe to uh, uh, Austin's uh, YouTube channel. And here, that's the first kind of positive comment I've heard about the new YouTube Google Plus situation. So uh, at least there is some positive things that can be said about it. Okay, next we have uh, Brother Jason Werner. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. How do you follow that one? Strong. <laughs> By the great God, right? Yes. Yeah, my YouTube channel is um, Jason Werner, W-E-R-N-E-R. J Warner 79, I guess, is a channel. I don't know a whole lot about YouTube, but I got some videos up there about my ministry and what my friends and I do in the Cleveland, Ohio area. We work with, uh, as I talked on, um, what was it, Wednesday, the first time up here, that, uh, well, we work with prisoners, um, the homeless in downtown Cleveland. A lot of street preaching, you know, and... My family and I were just happy and loving the Lord, receiving His grace. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, most people who are familiar with my channel know that uh, I've done a lot of street preaching, and I've actually done a lot of preaching against street preachers in general because very few of them are preaching the real message of salvation. Uh, and so, at least I know there are a few. Uh, I know that Brother Jason uh, knows and, and teaches the true message that salvation comes by faith alone, not by repenting of sins or joining a religion or changing your life. It's simply by trusting Jesus as your Savior. So, uh, Jason's one, and there's there's a few others out there who are do, doing a good job. For disclosure, preaching. you can look at my videos from even last year. I was bringing it down hard on people. You need to repent and turn from your sins. Jesus said it. You got to repent and be baptized. Uh -huh. No, that's called discipleship. That's not, you know, the, the way people are to be saved. It's trust in Christ, believe, and thou shalt be saved. It's very simple. Amen. Okay, next we have Brother uh, Jackson. Hello. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jackson, and. I've been putting up videos lately, and I, I mainly focus on analysis of things. I like to analyze things, and I like to evaluate things. Um, I, I, I have Asperger's syndrome, and I'm, I'm 21 years old, and I'm a college student, and I just really enjoy the sort of intellectual aspect of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I know that we're all very happy that you're making these videos now. 
Uh, you're doing a great job. I, I encourage everybody to go to his channel and watch his videos. He has like about four or five videos up now, and uh, every one of them is excellent. Uh, so next we have uh, Brother Mitch. Hello, everybody. It's Brother Mitch. I, I, too, have a YouTube channel, and I have Asperger's Syndrome. I am also very analytical, and I really like to look at the scriptures to see the grace of God. And I see that there's a faction of people who want to distort that grace and bring us back under a yoke of slavery when the gospel that was given to us should set us free. And it is that gospel that I believe we should cling to, for it can lick their message hollow. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I hope you'll go to his channel and watch all his videos. Uh, uh, he will really make you think and make you really uh, uh, question maybe some of the things that you've uh, taken for granted before. So it will be very worthwhile and stimulating. Uh, next we have Sister Tiffany. Hello. My name is Tiffany. Um, I have a channel on YouTube, and it's T-Day 6. And starting off, I'm into a lot. Of, I'm a girly girl, so I'm into a lot of girly things. I'm also into uh, spreading the gospel, um, which is Jesus Christ, um, trusting in him and him only um, for salvation. Um, for a long time, I thought that I was alone in this ministry, but I'm just now finding out that there are a lot of soldiers for Christ out there who really believe in um his saving grace. And I'm new to the panel, but I'm going to be observing a lot and hopefully, you know, I'll get better with time. Thank you for having me on here. All right. Thank you, sister. Uh, we're very happy that you can join us. Uh, I, I think you just need to turn your volume up a little bit. I don't know if anybody else had a problem, but I, your, uh, your voice was a little bit faint, so turn it up a little louder for us. Uh, yeah, I think as you get to know uh, Sister Tiffany more, you'll find out that uh, she's not going to just spend all of her time listening. Uh, once you get her started talking, uh, she has a lot to say. And uh, I had a real good talk with you yesterday, and uh, so I know that she'll be a, a big help to all of us. Uh, and actually, we have Sister Tanya. She might not be there because uh, she has children to take care of, so she comes in and out. Okay. When she comes back, we'll have her say hi to everybody. Uh, okay, let's begin now. Uh, right where we left off last time, talking about the, uh, the doctrines of the JWs. Um, here's something, this may seem like a trivial thing to, to people, but uh, this is what they believe. Uh, they teach that saluting a flag is an act of idolatry. Uh, when we show respect to a flag, we are doing an act of worship to another god. Uh, so, uh, by the way, uh, I'm not going to call on people, just whoever talks first, just start talking, and then before I move on to the next uh, topic, uh, I'll see if anybody else has anything to say if you're a little slow at the draw. So what is your first reaction to this idea that the JWs think that saluting a flag is idolatry? I would say that in, in light of what I hear about Paul saying an idol is nothing, I would say that, that, that um, they're looking at, at old Jewish law and that you know they're not they weren't supposed to have an idol and there's a lot of superstition when it comes to this kind of um, you know belief but the truth is is that the reason why an idol doesn't pertain to us because we don't actually bow down to it is because the true God where it says you shall have, have no other gods before me and you shall not make an idol in the Old Testament our true Savior is Jesus Christ and because we know the only way to heaven there is no such thing as idolatry because we know Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a different ways we could approach answering this question, and uh, as Mitch usually does, he goes right back to the grace of God, and that we're not under the law anyway. So uh, it's it's just a crazy that they're even bringing it up. But they're legalistic. They're they're religious. They're not. Uh, they don't believe we're saved by 
by grace through faith alone, Christ alone. Okay, what does uh, anybody else want to say something about that? That's that's strong. I like what Mitch said, bring it back to the law, and we're going to see that a lot. Personally, I have a problem with pledging allegiance to uh, anything, anybody, but here's the thing. Where the legalism line is drawn is, are we pledging allegiance to the flag of the nation or the government or the corporation of the United States of America, which is corrupt, or are we pledging allegiance in honor to that? How are we doing that? And they've taken it to the extreme. A good example of this is the person in the book of the Acts, somebody, I mean, any of you guys would be able to help me out with this. You guys know the Bible quite well. The Bible, I think it might have been Cornelius. It's just, uh, the, the writer says that this guy uh, feared God and he loved his nation or feared the nation or something. Who knows about that? Hmm. Oh, wow. I'll have to go back in the books of Acts and find that. I think it was Cornelius, but this guy had a, a reverence and a love for his country. Pledging allegiance to the flag, which we all know is not, we're not bowing down to this as an idol, as Mitch said, we just nailed it. We yeah. should still have a reverence for our country. Obviously, knowing that the United States of America government is corrupt and everything, and still, we're to, we're to uh, pray for our people who are in those kind of um, what they call leadership positions. Mm -hmm. It is obviously legalist. Yeah, I would. Uh, I think that there are a couple of things that come to my mind that were examples where uh, your uh, the scriptures cites a non-Jew and talks about you know, how righteous they are and they they're doing this good thing and they're they love their nation and so on. So there are some that were non-Jews that they are uh, recognized for at least some good things that they're doing. Jackson, were you going to say something? Yeah, it seems like a fallacy to me to say that patriotism is akin to worship. They seem like two different things to me. Wow, nice one. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing. Here, here's the reason why, though. Because a patriot wants what's best for his country. He doesn't necessarily worship his country, and not, not even necessarily he doesn't even ever cease to qu it's not well in other words it's not like a blind pledge everything my country does I'm going to agree with so if you, by taken by that logic love your neighbor if you're going to if we're going to be as extreme as the Jehovah's Witnesses are we could say love your neighbor is idolatry because you shouldn't love your neighbor you should only love God and that kind of thing so I think the distinction between wanting the best for something and loving something and worshiping something needs to be made Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a very interesting point. Uh, I think we're getting away, uh, which is uh, from the, the, the question really of uh, saluting a flag, or as, as uh, Jason said, saying a pledge of allegiance. Uh, and that's different than being patriotic or loving your country. That's a, to that's a different topic entirely. Uh, but uh, does anybody want to say anything about this before I cite a couple of scriptures to consider? All right, then I'm going to ask uh, Brother Austin to look up Numbers 2-2. Two, two. And Brother Jason, you look up Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. And Brother Jackson, you look up Numbers 10, verses 14, 18, and 22. And when you have those read, whoever has it ready, just start reading them. Okay, I have Numbers 2-2, uh, two, two, Luke. Okay. Numbers 2-2 two, two states, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard, with the ensign of their father's house, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. Okay, so by pitch by their own standard, what, what, what does it mean? What does that word standard mean? Uh, tradition? Is it referencing tradition? I think you'll find if you do a, a, a cross-reference on, on that, you're going to find that the st standard is just another word for flag or your, your, uh, your, the, the sign that recognizes that, that you're in that particular tribe. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's a flag. Each of these encamps had their own flag. 
So uh, obviously, if there's some reason we shouldn't be having flags or using flags in any way, then uh, I guess they wouldn't they wouldn't have a, f a flag or a standard, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, before I move on to the next one, does anybody have anything to add on that? Okay, let's go to uh, Romans 13. Well, let me give some uh, tense disclosure here, folks. This is the King James Version, and it's extremely different than the newer, New International Version, New American Standard Bible. Um, you mean any particular verses you're referring to, or just overall? Yes, and I'll, and I'll explain the, the, the Okay. I wrote a short book about this. Okay. Obviously, I work with the prisoners, you know what I'm saying? And okay. I have right. to explain to them why they're not under the uh, false oh, very good. prosecution in the way government is using uh, corporations today in America. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Third verse. For rulers are not a terror to good works. But to the evil, wilt thou then not uh, be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. I'm going to the fourth verse. He said go to seven, right? Yeah. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, it, uh, wherefore he must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. And the last verse reads, Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And it's also something similar in uh, Paul's letter to Titus and uh, Peter also wrote about that. You want to jump in here, Luke? Uh, well, I just want to see if anybody wants to respond to what you read there first. What are we getting from that related to the subject we're talking about right now, which is, are we are we forbidden from saluting a flag or saying a pledge of allegiance or in that kind of a thing? I, I think that what he's, he said there is paying tribute. It, this is really telling us that we're supposed to give honor and respect to the nation, to the leaders, to the to the flag, and and it uh, we should be respectful. It doesn't mean that you don't ever uh, disagree with your government or. Uh, you know, try to change it, and as we do in this country, but uh, we're supposed to give honor and respect, and that that is an example of saluting a flag or saying a pledge of allegiance. Okay, um, anybody want to add to that before we go to the next verse? Yeah, I do have something to say about that. I think the way they look at it is somewhat the way uh, they look at it in the Old Testament again. If we look at um, you know, verses where they had people that had to worship idols and they were going to be thrown into the furnace if they didn't worship idols. Okay, we had examples of people that were told, told to bow down to these idols. And uh, we had examples of Mordecai, who was a Jew, who uh, was the uncle, I believe, of Esther, or, Had or um, Hadassah, in the, the, the book of uh, 
uh, Esther, um, where um, she, um, her Mordecai had to bow down to Haman, and he wouldn't do it because he wouldn't bow down to a man. So you have these Old Testament examples again of 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 of, of, of not worshiping a man or not worshiping an idol. But we're not worshiping a flag, first off, and as I, I as I, I said before, the reason why that doesn't apply is because really that was pertaining to us, what shall we bow down to? We don't bow down to anything because we know Christ. So, you know, for us it's neither here nor there, but for them it's another binding under the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me just ask this question. Well, let's read the last verse here that... Uh, let me see, J Jackson has the last one, and then uh, I'm going to ask a question to everyone. All right. Go ahead, Jackson. Numbers 14, what did you say? Uh, numbers 10, verses oh, no. 14, 18, and 22. Oh, okay, Numbers 10, okay, 14, 18, and 22. All right, I've got it right here. All right, verse 14 says, In the midst, oh, sorry, in the first place, went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah according to their armies and over his host was Nashon the son of Aminadab okay you said verses 14 18 18 18 says and the standard of the camp of Reuben set forward according to their armies and over his host was Elazur the son of Shedur. So I see 14, 18, 22 reads, And the standard of the camp of the children of Ephraim set forward according to their armies, and over his host was Elishama, the son of Amahud. Amahud. Okay. So again, we have this idea of a standard being lifted up on, above their camp. So uh, my question is, uh, we know that we're under grace anyway. I mean, even if the law had said, and apparently this, even in Judaism, it's not illegal, according to Judaism, to uh, have these flags. So, uh, but we're not under the law anyway. So my question to each one of you is, um, is there any reason why you think, as a as a Christian, that you are should not be saluting a flag, uh, the the American flag, or uh, even saying, say, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? Good point. Even under the law. Wow, strong, strong move. Mm -hmm. Okay. I uh, I'll chip in. I uh, I stand strong on. Uh, I guess you say patriotism. Uh, I'm grateful for what uh, I know people's opinions and the wars that our country has fought are uh, held in high question and uh, maybe not in the best manner and sometimes maybe for the wrong reasons. I understand that. But uh, regardless, throughout our uh, our history of a country of, as a nation, uh, I'm grateful for the men and women that serve to protect, to ensure our, uh, our country's growth and freedom. And uh, ever since I've been raised, I've always said the pledge. Uh, I've always flown a flag, and uh, I I don't see any reason why uh, if you don't, even if you didn't agree with your your government or something else, why you should uh, be disrespectful to the men and women that uh, will uh, serve for you and try to uh, protect you and defend their uh, defend this nation with their lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm just assuming that we're all patriotic Americans to varying degrees, and we probably all have our grievances against America in, in varying degrees. So, uh, but that being said, uh, the idea of saluting a flag or saying Pledge of Allegiance is not an unchristian thing to do then. Is that correct? Anybody disagree with that? No, not at all. I'd like to say, if you look at the words, actually the way it was worded, you know, uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag. I don't pray to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, a nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You're not praying to the flag at all 
and you're actually glorifying the idea that it's one nation under God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a problem, though. I heard that there were songs dedicated to the called President Barack Hussein Obama, whereby children were singing to the name of this... Oh yeah, that was that was like worship. Yeah, as a Christian, yeah, I can object to that. that. If we yes, put a name, I, I know exactly what you were talking about there. If we put a name on this stuff, now we got a problem. But we're looking at you know a nation as a whole. You know. The, the, yeah, I know exactly what you. I know just the songs you're talking about, Jason. Yeah, that disgusted actually, me uh, as a Christian. Right, I actually have those videos on my channel and my playlist. Uh, I think it's exposing lies dealing with Jesus Christ. It's in that. It's in that playlist. It's uh, it was in California, Brother Jason. That's uh, where it where it was uh, orchestrated. Mhm. Mm yeah, I think we're probably all familiar with that uh, scene in the school where the children were singing that song. So, um, all right. Uh, but let me make this point. The uh, as we go through these teachings or doctrines from the JWs. Um, do you think that it's possible that JWs, we're going to find any doctrines from the JWs that we uh, dis that we do not have a, a disagreement? Or is it possible that we might find any doctrines they have and say, well, they're not wrong on that one? I don't think they're wrong that, they're, that theism is true. Okay, so there's one thing you uh, you can see right right away. Then. I, I think it's a logic fallacy to say that everything somebody says, even if they're wrong on the whole, is all completely wrong, regardless of who it is. Yeah. You know, what if Adolf Hitler said, "I like strawberry ice cream"? Does that make strawberry ice cream evil? <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. You made a good point, and you made me laugh at the same time. <laughs> um, okay, so my point is, whether we're studying uh, Mormonism or JWs or Roman Catholicism, as we go through all this, uh, even though we think they're um, seriously wrong in the most important uh, theology questions, uh, they may not be, be necessarily be wrong in everything they teach. And we're going to go through it point by point and say, uh, do we have a problem with this doctrine? Do we have a problem with this doctrine? Um, now let's move on to this next uh, teaching, and that is um, the society believes that those who do not use God's name, which they understand to be Jehovah, cannot be identified as his people. Uh, and I have in my notes Acts 15, 14, so... Uh, let me see. Uh, Tiffany, could you look up Acts 15, 14? Uh, let, me, let me just read this point. And also, uh, uh, Brother Mitch, could you look up John 1, verse 12? And Tanya, are you back with us? I'll have to put yes, glass. sir. Could you look up Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 20? Sure. Okay. Now, let me just read this little paragraph here. Uh, the use of a special word as a way to identify with a particular god or religion is an ancient pagan practice dating back centuries. A word is its is itself has in itself has no power more power than any of the mantras or mystical words of the Eastern religions. The word Jehovah carries with it no unusual or mystical significance. Confirmation of this can be be seen in the fact that Jehovah as a designation for God the Father does not appear even once in the New Testament. The many appearances of this in the New World Translation of the New Testament produced by the Watchtower Society has no historical or manuscript basis whatsoever. It is absolutely and completely an invention by the Society. Furthermore, the use of the word Jehovah is a genuine embarrassment to the Watchtower Society in that it represents a linguistic mistake. The word is a result of a mistransliteration of the word Yahweh, uh, plus the word uh, the ancient Hebrews used in its place, Adonai. Uh, the ancient 
Hebrew scribes were concerned that they might somehow misuse the name of God and thus even inadvertently violate the third commandment. As a precaution, they placed the four consonants for the name of God, Y-H-W-H, in the text of the scripture as they copied it, but included the vowels of word for Lord, which they would speak in its place. This jumble of consonants of one word and the vowels from the other led to the appearance and use of the word Jehovah. Consider also the many other names and titles for God found in the scriptures. Uh, I don't think we're going to go through all that part. but uh, uh, So there's the uh, kind of the origin of the English word Jehovah, which the JWs use as their kind of their test and their identification that they are Jehovah's Witnesses. So I don't know if anybody was familiar how that was, that word was even constructed, uh, but if you are, what do you think of that? Yeah, they didn't have any vowels uh, in the original texts at all. They were added. They were added much later. But the Jewish word for God is Hashem. It means the name. It's very funny how the Jews always use the name, and there is no other name under heaven thou shalt be saved by, but Yeshua, which means God saves. So, and this word Lord, by the way, in capital letters, they were careful not to say Jehovah in the New Testament also, but, but the whole idea that, that, that you have to pronounce a name or know the name Jehovah to get saved that takes away from the whole idea that all you have to do is believe that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saves, and he saves through Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And the name itself tells you salvation. God saves. It seems like this has some like, sort of something in common with the sacred name movement, which I'm sure we've all run into. Right, yeah, Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's another type of sacred name movement, isn't it? Yeah, because you know the sacred name people like to make such a big issue of, of being offended at the word Jesus and you need to you need to call him something like Yeshua or Yeshua or something like that or what's interesting call him something that means the exact same thing if you're talking about Yeshua so mm -hmm. uh, does this uh, is this new to anybody were you aware that uh, the word Jehovah uh, is a transliteration of, of the consonants of Yahweh and the vowels from Adonai. The proper pronunciation, which is interesting that they're changing it to Jehovah, is actually Yahweh in the Hebrew tongue. If we're going to, you know, say, hey, we're not saying God's name, when, why don't we just say Yahweh instead of saying Jehovah? If we're going to translate Yeshua to Jesus, which is the Hebrew of, of Jesus, mm -hmm. The whole point here, when we're reading English, is to read what it would mean in English. I mean, the J is, it's an issue even with uh, a Spanish. It's it's like Julian or Julian, you know, and it's, there's nothing wrong with putting that J in there and, and making it sound as an English word. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, look, do you want to tell me the verses that I asked you to look up? Uh, Acts 15, 14, what's that say? Acts 15, 14. Can you hear me clear? A little louder. Okay. Um, it says, Simeon had declared how God at the, first, at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Okay. So they are trying to use that to justify that uh, this idea of uh, that this name is, is so important, Jehovah. Uh, how about John one twelve? John one twelve. Oh, that was what it was. Hold on, let me switch glasses. <laughs> you know, I got this that attention deficit thing going on here, so I flipped over to John, John one twelve. Yeah. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. But as I said before, his name means God saves. No matter what language you say it in, if you believe in his name, you believe God saves. Yeah. And let's, you've done a lot of um, videos on this one word. 
And uh, I've mentioned it numerous times in my videos too, the significance of the word Jesus. Now Jesus is the way that we uh, pronounce it in English. Uh, I'm not sure how they came up with it, but it's our English way of saying uh, Yeshua. And Yeshua uh, literally means God saves or God who saves. God is the one who saves. And uh, that's the idea that we get. And so Jesus was appropriately named because he is this God who saves. And it's faith in his name, faith in him personally to be our Savior that is uh, the, uh, the critical thing that we must come to understand in our lives. Right. They, they actually think that a lot of people are saying that because Zeus is in there, it was actually praying to Zeus. So when you yeah, say he's Zeus, that. you know, supposedly now you're, you're, you're invoking Zeus's name. But it, again, it's this superstitious idea that the word means Zeus. But if you tell somebody Jesus, he's not thinking Zeus. He's thinking yeah. the God who saves. And that's the point. Yeah. You know, I, uh, lost, I lost my best friend because he started oh, a few years ago because he was dating a girl who was in this sacred name movement thing and everything. And one of the, I remember one of the main points was how wrong it was to refer to him as Jesus. You had to say Yeshua because yeah. Jesus was pagan or whatever. I mean, it's it's a cult, the sacred name movement. Mm -hmm. I want nothing to do with it. Uh, I know that uh, all the time I, when I'm typing a comment or a, a PM to somebody, and I, t I always, whenever I type the, the name Jesus, I always put it all in caps. And so I, but I don't know why, but very often I'll type it in and I look at it and realize, wait, I left out the first S, and it's J E U S. And I think, oh, gosh, it looks too much like Zeus now, like what you were saying, Mitch. You know, I think because I'm familiar with that argument that oh, it's just another name for Zeus. So <laughs> make sure you always put in your middle S. Okay, what's the Revelation three twenty? All right, Revelation three twenty. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to to him and eat with him and he with me. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I guess uh, I think I put that in there for the, the reason that uh, uh, it's not a belief in the name Jehovah uh, that, that uh, is significant. What's significant is uh, being born again. And this verse here is just kind of an illustration of being born again. When you go through that door and you have joined with Jesus in uh, faith, then uh, uh, it's like going through the door, going through the gate, drinking the water, eating the bread of life, whatever, all these different things that Jesus said that was uh, was analogous to just believing in him and trusting him. That's what we need to do, not worship the name Jehovah. Okay. Um, let's go on to another... Uh, another current teaching... Okay, uh, the current teaching of the Watchtower Society. We mentioned this before, but I guess we'll go into it a little bit more. It says, um, they say that the good news of the kingdom, or the gospel, the JWs say the gospel is that Jesus has been ruling and reigning since 1914. Well, I think that uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says otherwise. Yeah, well, that's the first thing we're going to look at. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You probably have it memorized. Uh, so the, the word uh, gospel is, is associated with the, these particular verses. And I know that uh, myself and I know quite a few other people who have uh, said that the, the gospel uh, can be expressed in other words than this. Uh, it is the good news that we can be saved by putting our faith in Jesus as our Savior. The idea that he died on a cross and rose from the dead makes us understand how he's able to accomplish all these things, uh, how he paid for our sins, and that he has power over life and death. But the significant thing we've got to do is put our faith in him personally to save us. Uh, but so the, nowhere in, in the... The scriptures does say the gospel is that Jesus returned 
and set up his kingdom in 1914. <laughs> That's just like laughable. Uh, yeah, so I think we, when we talked about that last time, Jackson, you said that it sounds like they're, they're preterists, but instead of thinking 70 AD was if it was fulfilled, they believe it was 1914. So he yeah, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a, just like, it's kind of, it's, it, one thing I think you'll notice about a lot of these groups, actually, is that they are kind of a mishmash of a lot of different strange theologies within Christendom. You look how you've got you've got partial preterism here, but look how you also have kind of a sacred name movement kind of thing, mm -hmm. and then you have the no allegiance to country, and you can find people within Christendom who are not Jehovah's Witnesses who hold to similar things like this, and notice how it's kind of a big mixture, like a stew of all this. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, unless you want to say something else about. Uh, this point that they believe that Jesus already returned. Uh, well, does, it, does anybody think that? I would like to say what? Yeah, you know how they said that that's the gospel. Yeah, they're claiming that they're not just claiming that this happened. They're claiming that the gospel is that this happened. Isn't there a verse in Galatians? I think chapter two, where it says, "If if anyone bring you any other gospel, let him be an anathema." One. Yeah. First chapter. Galatians chapter one. Okay. Yeah, it had to do with some people from Antioch. Yeah, because 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 that's the thing. I mean, because it's a, in my opinion, it'd be one thing, if, even though it would still be very very wrong to say Jesus has come back, but to claim that that's the gospel seems to take it to a new level, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I just want to make that point quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now they also it says the current teaching of the Watchtower Society: we are not saved by grace alone. To be saved, one must be an active Jehovah's Witness, following all the, of the rules and regulations of the society. Who, who does this sound a lot like? My buddy. My <laughs> buddy, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> all those, all oh. those Jimmyites. <laughs> Did you get my comment about Jimmy? Yeah, I that did. Funny. <laughs> Jimmy. Um, well, whether they're Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons or just uh, you know Christians who are really um, uh, Lordship Salvationists, they're all guilty of the same um, uh, heresy. And I, I don't use heresy about a lot of different things, but I, I will I will reserve it for these things. And that is that if Jesus says if someone says that Jesus is not God Almighty, then I say, well, they're they're worthy of being called a heretic. Uh, if someone says that faith in Jesus for your salvation is not enough, that you've got to uh, perform and do certain things in addition to believing on Jesus, then I say that's a heresy. And if they believe that we can uh, somehow lose our salvation, I, I say that's a heresy. But uh, a lot of these other things, even though they're false teachings, I I kind, of, I kind of reserve the word heresy for these most serious crimes. And so all of these uh, things that are under Christendom, as we've discussed before, how, what percentage of all of Christendom do you think are really putting their faith in Jesus completely and not in their personal performance? What percentage of Christendom? Uh, I'd say a smaller percentage than what we think. Probably 1% is my guess. Hmm. Tanya, what do you think? <clears throat> I did not hear all of that. I'm sorry. My son woke up. Okay. So I'll pass. The, the, question, the question is, uh, okay. Christendom. Mm -hmm. Christendom it does not mean Christian. It means uh, the people who are under the umbrella, who are kind of labeled. Like, let, let's say you're filling out a questionnaire and ask you your, your height, your weight, your phone number, your address, your, your race, your religion, and when it comes to religion, you check off, uh, well, let me see, I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Muslim, I'm oh, Christian. So they check off Christian. In other words, they are, they are labeled or, or identified as Christian. That's, that's what we call Christendom. Mm -hmm. Out of all of Christendom in the world, what percentage are Christians? The, who are the people who rely completely on Christ for their salvation and, and admit 
that they're helpless to, to work their way to heaven and their works are not part of it. Um, if I have to take a guess, I would say maybe 20, 30 percent. Yeah. And that's I, being I, generous, I think. The reason I don't think it's that high is because Catholics are, um, are considered in the mix here. Mm -hmm. the don't. Well, yeah. if, one, if one third of the world's population is, is in Christendom, uh, and then about half of those are Roman Catholics, and if almost all of the Roman Catholics are not putting their faith in the Savior, but they're putting their faith in their own performance, then we can rule out uh, about one half of the one third, which leaves us like 15%. And then out of all of those people left, what percentage of the regular, let's say, Protestant churches around the world uh, are teaching Lordship salvation? Probably 90%. Yes. Uh, so I think that that gets us down to probably 1 or 2% of the population of the world. That's, now, maybe, uh, that's a low number. Yeah. Now, maybe I'm being uh, uh, too harsh. I think that's, no, uh, no, I think that's I pretty spot on, Luke. Yeah, I understand you. It's just it's a sad number. Yeah, what I what I mean. It's a, well, it also it conforms. It, it it also conforms with what Jesus said about uh, the many and the few. Right. Right. Many go down the wide road of destruction. Only a few go down this narrow road that leads to life, and that narrow road is putting your faith in Jesus. So it's only a few that are going to be that are saved. But my point in making this is, yeah, Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in faith alone in Christ alone, but that's that can also be said about all the religions of the world. Uh, but that, to me, is their fatal the fatal flaw: uh, the identity of Jesus and what they need to do to receive eternal life. That's where they really fail. These other things are, I'm not downplaying the seriousness of them, but they're not going, keeping them uh, from having eternal life. Um, so give me a couple of verses that show that we're saved by faith alone off the top of your head, whoever wants to say something. Uh, and Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. Okay. Take, take, yeah. Taken from Romans chapter 4, not from James chapter 2. <laughs> That's kind of an inside joke unless you've been following all of uh, Mitch's recent videos. Uh, okay, how about Ephesians 2, 8, 9? For it is by grace we are saved through faith, and this not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as <clears throat> anyone should boast. What's oh, you one? stole mine. What? Okay, what, what about... Oh, Romans 4, 5 and 4, what? 6. Romans 4, 5 and 4, 6. Can you say them? It is... Um, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay. And then four six says that even so, hang on, let me so I don't butcher the wording too bad. Let me quickly turn to four six. It says, oh yeah, okay, four six says, even as David describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, it says, mm -hmm. without them. Yeah. Uh, we could go on and on for probably uh, an hour just reading one verse after another, after another, after another that says the only thing we'll need that's required of us for salvation is putting our faith in the Savior, Jesus. Uh, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, off the top of our head, we could just go on and on and on. So that's how clear-cut this question is. And so that is an easy thing to show that this is a serious, fatal mistake that the JWs are making. Okay, let's go on to another, another one of these. Um, the current teaching of the Watchtower Society... The society does not believe in celebrating any holidays, national or otherwise, and condemns those who do. Christmas, birthdays, any of anything else. So, uh, is that biblical or not? In the Old Testament, um, you know, they, they had appointed feasts, but people still had parties. As a matter of fact, they made up for, for them. 
So, um, you know, I wouldn't consider it even biblical, actually. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, I firmly support them not celebrating Christmas. Uh, my birthday was nine days ago. Happy birthday. And for some reason, I just had to go look up where this whole... Because on Facebook, people keep posting happy birthday, happy birthday, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I went up and looked up, what, really, this whole idea of happy birthday, where did this come from? And I know I, I personally have had the debates with the J-Dubs for years that they were... I kept telling them, they were telling them, you're being legalistic about this whole birthday thing. They couldn't give me a real reason why they shouldn't celebrate it. And except for the fact that, you know, uh, Pharaoh, one of his servants was killed on his birthday, and then, of course, John the Baptist was beheaded on his birthday. I firmly support them, knowing what's happening on these birthday things. This stuff is messed up. 34th birthday was just nine days ago. I looked it up. We are really messing with spirits, and we don't know it. I have some new friends on Facebook. I learned about a church in South Africa, and a lot of uh, Nigerian friends. Love Africans. Great. They're telling me that we don't realize here in America what we're doing when we just speak things. They've got a lot of people who are, what do you call them, witches and warlocks. They are literally, that's their whole, like, all day long. All they do is cast spells on people. They get mad at somebody, they go to see a witch, and she will literally, like, use a pigeon or all kinds of weird things to cast a spell on somebody, and they'll go do it, and it does work. They, These people who used to be... The warlocks, you know, they say to me, you people in America, you don't realize it, but you're doing the same exact thing with your hospitals, the way you're doing it, the things that you're saying and speaking negative things over other people. And it's like, wow, these birthday things, the whole thing of, like, um, happy birthday, it's to protect us so that we don't have attacks by these evil gods. E ourselves, even though we don't see it that way, the origin of this stuff. The Jehovah's Witness, the problem with them is they're doing this and they don't understand why they're doing it. I support them in this. Now that I know what this whole Christmas and Nimrod and the, 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 mm -hmm. the fertility gods behind the, the wreath and the... Does anybody, does, anybody want to try, does anybody want to try to explain the rationale behind the, the JW is saying, don't uh, celebrate your birthday. What real possible real, rationale could they have for that? Real fast, is, is happy birthday, Jason, is that witchcraft? Is that what you're trying to say? Don't say happy birthday? Uh, you know what? I would say it is. Okay. Uh, I think um, one of the reasons they, and I don't know, I'm just kind of guessing, that they might not celebrate their birthday is because they think it's kind of like prideful to do so. Maybe. Um, you know, have you ever heard of the title to a, uh, a minister where he's called Reverend? Yes. Okay, I, I've always refused to refer to any person as Reverend. I mean, even if they got on their business card or they got a, uh, they got a uh, something, a certificate on the wall that says they're Reverend, uh, to me, I, I reserve all reverence to, for to God, so that's just me. I'm not saying everybody should do that, or that it's witchcraft, or the I'm condemning it anyway. It's just, it just for me, it just rubs me wrong to refer to any man or woman as reverend. Uh, and I can see how this they can take this birthday thing as trying to draw too much attention and uh, like uh, uh, pride to yourself. However, I won't go so far as they do, or or uh, Jason does. I see. Paul says that all these holidays are permissible. Don't try to don't try to impose on on people a certain days or holidays or foods or anything else. Give people the liberty to decide those things for themselves. Uh, we have a brother that we all know that he got quite upset with me one day because he was very irate, uh, very angry over Christmas and birthdays, and he doesn't allow it in his house. And I told him that I thought he was wrong on that, and that uh, that he should allow other people to have the freedom to do that if they want, and he's free not to do it. And uh, he didn't he didn't like that, but uh, uh, that's how I see it. Well, Mitch, were you saying something? 
Oh, no, I tipped my hat, but I did have something to say about this whole okay. situation. I do believe that there are warlocks and witches out there. And I do believe that they do use words, and they do. I do believe that they cast spells. I, I, I think that, 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 that that's, uh, you know, that's very possible. But as a Christian, because I'm under the blood of Jesus Christ, I am, I am totally and completely not afraid. First of all, second of all, when it comes to Christmas and the and the worshiping of these gods, I mean, we know that they come from Babylon. We know that 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 this all was infiltrated. But the thing is, is that, like I said, an, an idol really is nothing. Why? Because I know Christ, and I'm not fooled or deceived by the idea that a Christmas tree is it means this or a wreath means that. Or supposedly, because I have a Christmas tree, I'm praying to Ishtar or, 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 or Horus. Because I know Christ, all of that stuff doesn't matter. But for the weaker brother that's offended by it, okay, fine. And this is what Paul basically had the problem with. Remember, he had, he had Jewish brothers that couldn't get away from the idea that they were under the law. So for them to, to, to practice eating... Uh, at the at the uh, at the non-kosher table would be sin for them, so he gave them deference. You know, he gave the weaker brother deference and said, you know, let the person do what he does to the glory of God. But for the brother who knows that he's released from all of that, all the glory goes to that too. So an idol is nothing here or there, and words are words. But Christ, when when he set us free from all that mess. We are worshiping one God. We're worshiping the way, the truth, and the life. One way, Christ. And that's the answer. And so everybody seems to be going off in these crazy superstitions because they don't understand that we're saved. God saved us. Jesus, Yeshua, means God, Yeshua means God saves. And that's it. So there's no more superstitions or rules or anything that's, that's put upon us. Once we know Christ, we're free. Free from all of that. Does that mean that I, I, I purposely worship these things or I, or, or I advocate worshiping them? No, they mean nothing to me. However, out of, out of reverence for, for Christ, there's some things that I don't like that insult me. That's a different story. But well, the other thing is to be consistent, and this is just, just agreeing with everything Mitch said, to be consistent with this, you would have to not use the names of the days of the week because its origin is paganism, like Sunday, the sun god, and right. everything. Great point. And my question is, when does it stop? You know, when, uh, these are all pagan things that have that are, that are, have been adapted into our culture. Are you going to say, "I'll meet you on the third day"? Like, what do you mean? I, well, I, I can't use those those words that come before day because I'm advocating worshiping that God. I mean, come on. I tell you, oh, Jackson, you you really. I love it, Asperger's. The more I get to know Asperger's, I just love it. Man, you just really pinpoint it down and just can make it so concise, uh, the truth. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about my my thoughts on birthdays, Christmas, and Easter particularly. But first, anybody who wants to just those three holidays, how do you see them briefly, and see if anybody has wants to take a shot at that. I did, uh, real fast, I did look into, uh, one day I came across a brother's video on YouTube, and that was, uh, I think it was a history on, uh, Christmas. Uh, it, it opened my eyes a lot, and I, I did, I did realize that, you know, first of all, we all know that, uh, nowhere in the word does it say that Christ was born on the 25th, but, uh, a lot of people always, you know, use that against us some in some way, but I, I do know that regardless of what day he was born on, that that day should be honored for him alone, and most people don't see it as such, but I did realize that the tree and the gifts under the tree and the, the certain types of food and the greetings that go on with, were uh, very paganistic is what he said, and he, and he showed some background info, so I do know what Jason's getting at. I did uh, I do I do know that most of, uh, most of the traditions that we do pertain to a lot more than what we uh, perceive as uh, natural and uh, sometimes it's more than meets the eye on uh, common practices we do mm -hmm. yeah I wonder what the 
Jehovah's Witnesses do for weddings? I don't even know about that, but weddings are also <laughs> very pagan. I have a video about weddings and the whole idea of <coughs> church marriages and state marriages. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, legalism can go two ways. Uh, legalism can go where uh, you're, uh, you're, you've got to do certain things, and then also where you where you can take it to the other side and say, well, you better not do those things. And either way, it could be wrong, and that's why I think we have to always keep in mind what Paul said is that these things can be decided by each individual. Now, we can discuss the pagan back history of all these things, and we can discuss whether it's leading us into, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, becoming materialistic or whatever negative things that uh, can come out of it. Uh, but uh, we don't want to try to uh, become legalistic trying to impose it on everybody. They have to, everybody has to make those decisions for themselves. I'll tell you, since nobody's uh, said it, but to me, uh, I don't have any problem with, with a birthday. I don't see anything wrong with celebrating my birthday or anybody's birthday and even getting presents for them. If you just, uh, to me, I don't see anything uh, good or bad necessarily. I just had a birthday. And then I had a, someone was very upset because they didn't, someone didn't get me a, a present. You know, they expected to get me a present. I said, why? If, 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 you, if you are requiring it, then it's not a gift. It's an obligation. I mean, I, I don't want someone, I prefer someone to give me something. Uh, Tanya gave me this microphone I'm speaking into right now. It wasn't Christmas. It wasn't my birthday. It was no occasion. She just felt I needed it and was generous and did it for me and that's when it's that's where uh, I, I, you really value it because she didn't do it out of obligation because it was a holiday and I was expected so to me that's how I look at gifting for these holidays the problem I have with Christmas is that it's so much not about Christ in, in America for the most part it's all about Santa Claus and Rudolph and, and commercialism and buying and shopping and all that stuff I tell people uh, I celebrate Christmas every day. Every day is Christmas for me. I'm always celebrating his birth and death for my sins, his resurrection, his his uh, uh, lordship in my life. All these things I, I celebrate every day. And Easter, Easter, uh, it, it, that's Resurrection Day, but they've turned it into the bunny and and, and uh, Easter egg hunts and stuff. So those kinds of things bother me. But if a certain if a person was putting Christian, uh, putting Christ in the middle of Christmas and the resurrection in the middle of Easter, and just giving uh, because uh, you're not out of obligation, but because it's someone's birthday and you want to do something nice, I think that's all acceptable, in my opinion. All right. We'll move on. Unless... Hello? I was just saying I, I agree with what you're saying. Absolutely. I want to say that the, the origins of this, you have to look back to the Old Testament. Why, why was it that they, they, that they weren't supposed to have an idol? Why was it that they did have in the Jewish traditions certain things that they did? And the reason why was it all pointed to one thing. It pointed to Christ. And so when all of that ended, when, when Christ came, all of those fulfillments happened, but people st still seemed to be you know, mesmerized by the traditions instead of seeing the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the most, the, the the biggest holiday, the biggest Jewish holiday, just passed. It was Black Friday. Black Friday is the Jewish holiday. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, I kid you not. I I used to drive for Jewish uh, families, and this one Jewish family, right, in Lakewood, New Jersey, right, one Jewish family, we're out for Black Friday. I've got the Jewish lady in the car with all the Jewish girls and all their girlfriends with their, with their, hanging their feet out the, out the sides of the, this little car. And they're all online at these different stores. And, 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 and who's at this Christian holiday? All the Jews are lined up for the bargains. They call them mitzias because the Jews love bargains. So, so here we have this Christian holiday, and the Jews are celebrating Black Friday like crazy. It's incredible. I, just, I thought it was so funny. So... Uh, Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, wasn't there, uh, I know that in the news that uh, this Thanksgiving was actually uh, the beginning of their Hanukkah, and it won't happen for another 80,000 years, it said, or something like that, but... 
I thought it was pretty significant. Wow, Hanukkah. Yeah, I have to call them. I have friends in I have Jewish friends in New Jersey. I have to give them a call and, and wish them a happy Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's talk about their New World Translation. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible is known as the New World Translation. The society believes that this version is the most accurate translation of the Bible and is the one they use in their teaching and Bible reading and they consistently quote it as their, in their literature. Many scholars refer to the New World Translation as a commentary on the Bible instead of a translation in light of the way the text has been altered to fit the various society doctrines. Uh, these changes are particularly evident when the subject of hell, the trinity, or the immortality of the soul are discussed. The following is a representative list of passages altered. There's a whole bunch of lists, a bunch of verses. I won't, we won't need to go into all of them, but we made the point earlier uh, in a previous show that uh, what, we're, what we're supposed to do is read the scriptures and it's called um, uh, exogesis. Exo means you come, comes out. Your truth comes out of the scriptures, but but uh, we don't put we, eisegesis means that we read into it. We read into it what we want to, and eisegesis means we just take the truth out of it, whatever it says. And what they've done is that uh, instead of reading the Bible and getting their doctrine, they established their doctrine through their committee and wrote their newsletters, and then they had to write, a, write their own Bible uh, in a rewrite it in a way that it would support their false doctrines. And that's what the New World Translation is. Uh, now, we have a lot of people though, that probably would argue that uh, how many people uh, here are, are KJV only on the, in the panel? I, uh, I like I So uh, we got Jason, Austin, anybody else? Jason, I, uh, huh? I usually read from the King James Version. Okay, uh, but I do too. But do you believe that it's, uh, you know, like, uh, well, let's, I don't want to say heretical, but it's, uh, you know, you shouldn't even read any of the other translation besides KJV. Are you KJV only and you wouldn't even look at the others? Well, me personally, from experience, starting out, I had a new international version. And that's how I started out reading my Bible, and I understood it very clear. Um, but I stayed away from the King James Version only because I didn't know how to read it. I couldn't comprehend it. And after praying, praying on it, I started to interpret the scriptures. And then I started to realize that there were a lot of scriptures that were interpreted completely different from the King James Version and um, you know after reading some of the commentaries I realized that whoever created that that particular version on um, they created the scripture based around what they interpreted from that scripture so it's not necessarily King James only I do read from other versions but I I just prefer, prefer the King James Version, but okay. I would never hold anyone else to it. Okay, um, so uh, we have a variety of people in this group here. Some are KJV only, some are KJ pre preferred, preferred, and some probably uh, prefer some other translation. Or and then I know people that like to just study in Greek or Hebrew. Or so those are all the different ways people look at this question. And, uh, you know, I, I was one of the strictest KJV only for many years, and, and I've read about 40 of Dr. Ruckman's books, who's the, like the king of KJV onlyism. So, I mean, I know all the arguments uh, to support KJV only as well as anybody, and yet I eventually changed my mind on that. Uh, but my point I'm making is that this New World Translation uh, is uh, has been translated in a way that it... In, they purposely changed verses to try to take away the deity of Christ and salvation through faith alone. They tried to change Christ into an angel, and it was their intent from the beginning to uh, translate it 
to support their doctrine instead of uh, getting scripture and then determining their doctrine out of the scriptures. Do you, you see the difference between the, the two ways, two approaches? Yeah, big difference. Just to give you an example, the um, New World Translation in Romans 10.9, I mentioned this in the show on Wednesday night, if thou shalt confess Jesus as a Lord and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, exercise his belief that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Exercise his belief is what they added to it. They looked at the Christians, obviously, none of, nobody's living a perfect life, but there's our Christians out there who call themselves Christians, they're living carnal, but they want to distinguish themselves from the professing Christians who were not living as godly as them or whatever the case is. And they put, it, they made an, uh, an effort to make, you know, hey, you got to put your works into this. And you're right on, Luke. It's all about getting those works. Exercise your belief in that. What's wrong just, with just translating what the original manuscripts say and just say believe? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, there, we could go through many verses and show, show how they've changed, uh, changed it so that Jesus is not God. Uh, that you know, it's it's very easy to prove. But it was it was their intention to write a Bible to change Jesus from God Almighty into an angel. So now let's go on to uh, this next doctrine that they teach is uh, Jehovah Witnesses boast that they do not take a collection during any of their meetings or gatherings. Uh, the witnesses do not have to take a collection. The entire operation of the society is an efficiently run business-like organization that depends heavily on sales of literature and donated labor. All of the magazines, books, etc. published by the society are sold to individual J uh, JWs. Whether these items are sold or given away is up to the individual society member. The society gives away just 19 watchtower uh, each month. Virtually everything printed or is sold to the individual JWs. All land for the Kingdom Halls is donated and construction time is donated by the individual witnesses. Everything they have is paid for by the witnesses themselves. As for the printing costs, laborers and at the printing factory in Brooklyn, New York receive uh, $14 per month plus room and board. As a consequence, printing costs are greatly reduced. They can thus afford to outprint much of the Christian world and have free salesmen to deliver their material. I like that, but where is the liberty? You know what I'm saying? How would you like to have a, a product and where you could have people going, giving you free labor, free salesmen, free production of, of your, your book, and, and you have like uh, hundreds of thousands of people going door to door every Saturday and um, uh, selling your product for you, having the free labor. Right, right. I have a question. I have a question, though, about that. Do the Jehovah's Witnesses have paid clergy or not? Because I know the Mormons don't. Uh, no, I don't believe they do. But I, I, I'm not sure about that. I, maybe it's coming up in my notes. I don't remember ever studying that. Because uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Whether I guess whether they do or don't, you could even make an argument even if they don't. But it sounds like it's like the Watchtower. What it, what it accuses so many other things like one of the things that one of their biggest criticisms of Christmas that we didn't actually mention was they talk about how commercial it is and everything and I think they may have some legitimate criticism there but here's the, here's the thing it, to me what you just said really lines up with a form of commercialism a form of benefiting off of the money of other people if that makes sense yeah um. Well, it, it, there, uh, there's really two real reasons this is bad. Uh, one is the, um, the 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 type of labor that they're getting uh, is being exploited, and then on the other hand, the reason people are doing the labor is because they believe they've got to sell those magazines. That's their ticket 
to, to salvation. It's works, and the works that they do, uh, I think it's point. They, want, they want to convert people to get more people selling magazines. Because as soon as they convert someone, there's another magazine salesperson. Right, right, right. Okay. That's uh, one thing we can always learn from a Jehovah's Witnesses is uh, if only the soul winners were as, as dedicated as them, the, going house to house or at least getting brother and sister go with you out preaching gospel. I mean, we could definitely uh, learn learn from that, learn from that at least from them. Mm hmm. Hmm. Uh, okay, sales of merchandise has not been nor should ever be the principal means by which the church ministers to its people and its community. Uh, here's some, it says, tithing, giving to the Lord a tenth of what one receives in wages and income, which is one of the forms re worship revealed and demonstrated in the Bible, is the plan God is using to accomplish his objective, namely reaching the world with the gospel. Uh, I don't agree with this. Uh, uh, this is uh, in, Can you explain that again, Luke? I don't, quite, I don't quite get that. They do believe in the 10th percent or they do not? No, uh, this, is, this is in the notes when I put this book together years ago that were in the notes. But uh, I'm wondering if, um, if you wouldn't mind, Tiffany, kind of uh, redoing your talk that you and I had about tithing. You don't have to go into all the de much detail if you don't want, but uh, say what you said uh, to that pastor about the concept of tithing, I think that's relevant to this. Um, basically, um, every Sunday he would do the, you know, the, the scripture reading from uh, Malachi 3, 8 and 9, and that was the scripture that he used to um, let the church know why they should do the, the tithing. And once I talked to him and I let him, I asked him, um, why, um, why, why does why does he tithe when it's not a requirement for the New Testament believer? And he gave me a funny look, and then um, I asked him, "Where does it say in the New Testament?" And he he could not give me an answer, and he told me that um, he never looked into it. He just accepted it because that's what he's always been taught, and. Um, Basically, I let him know that um, the Old Testament tithing was not even money. Um, it was a tenth. It was a tenth of the crops and um, food that the. Um, I'm trying to gather my words. Um, the Israelites were promised the promised land, which they received and the Levitical uh, priesthood, they didn't receive any of the inheritance. So the Israelites were commanded to give a tenth of their crops and their share um, so that the Levitical, so that they, the Levites could survive, you know, um, with some of that promise. And that was the requirement of the Old Testament. Well, now that Jesus is the high priest, um, there's no more uh, there's no more priest line, bloodline for us to keep. Well, for them to keep giving ten percent. And his thing was, he said that he was going to take out the Malachi scripture because it was very scary and demanding. Um, but he said he wasn't going to do the 10%, the, the tithing, the 10%. And I told him that the definition of tithe is 10%. You know, so um, he didn't really understand that tithe is 10%. So um, he took it out and, you know, he still, he still managed to do the tithing. He just changed the scripture to fit his desire for collecting money. Okay, uh, so what she's really pointed to is the idea of this this tithe is to literally translate to tenth. 
So uh, in, in Judaism, the tribes received the land and, and, and each tribe got their share except for the Levites. They didn't get a share of the land and what was produced. Their job was to just do the priestly duties. And because they did, couldn't like uh, farm the land and, and, and have herds, they, they needed help. So they were instructed, to, everybody should give a tenth of everything they, they produce and give it to the priesthood to support them. So that was at Judaism. Now, what does it say in, about the church today about giving? And is the tithe, uh, are we instructed to continue this tithing that they had in Judaism? No, we're not supposed, we don't have to do that. And actually the early Christian church, they pretty much shared everything they had with each other, which I think is awesome. It would be nice. Sometimes I wish I could just kind of move to a commune of Christians and we all just, you know, <laughs> sat around campfire every night and sang songs to God and shared our bread. <laughs> you know, that'd be so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it would be. It would be great if that actually lasted, but by chapter four or, or two chapters later, that ended. Yeah. And the reason why that yeah. ended is because because of uh, uh, of um, supposedly there were disputes between the Jews and the Gentiles again because the Jews were taking the bigger portions, and so um, so it was work it was working for a little bit, and in, in the kingdom of heaven it'll work. But as, as we can see, is 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 that on, on earth it, it's nearly impossible for that to happen. Unless you join the Yellow Deli, which if you ever heard of the Yellow Deli people, there's another bunch of people that do it, where they give all their money away and they work at the Yellow Deli, and they're they're a bunch of uh, legalists also. But the whole idea is great, and it, it's it's where we get communism, but it can't work. Yeah, here's a uh, here's the reason. Uh, first of all, I can give you two examples in Christianity where this sharing didn't work. Uh, when, it, when they talk about how they sold everything they had and they all shared it, again, that only lasted for a very short time and it all fell apart. Uh, another example of that is when uh, the pilgrims came to America in Plymouth, they set up this uh, system where they're going to all get an equal share of everything and they st almost starved to death, death the first year because what happens is if you have a hundred people who are supposed to be working the land and producing and stuff, uh, some people think, well, gee, uh, I'm going to get the same share whether I work hard or not. And it turns out that a lot of people weren't working very hard, wanting that free ride, and then it turns out that there was no production and they all starved. Then the, the leader said after the first year when they barely made it, he changed it to a system where everybody got to keep what they produced. And then they were able to, then they prospered. So the idea is that as long as we have this flesh, and we have this sin nature, uh, we, are, we are not good enough to follow a system of communism because not everybody will do their fair share, their equal share, and then when they don't, other people get mad at them and then they, they don't do it because it's not fair that they're working harder than the other guy. So the whole system falls apart. It did in the beginning of the church in Acts, it did in, in uh, uh, Plymouth, Plymouth Rock and that settlement and it still has done it does the same thing all over the world today and it's, when there comes a point where we're no longer in this have this sin nature and we're just totally uh, want to just give and share completely and work hard for the benefit of everybody then it can work and maybe that's what it'll be like in heaven but I don't think I don't know if we're going to ever have to produce anything or if everything's just going to be so abundant we won't need to I don't know but that's that's the idea is that uh, uh, the idea of giving today in the church, Paul says, one, you're supposed to be a cheerful giver, and and two, there's no percentage assigned to it. I mean, if you if you have enough, someone's got me getting back. So I'm eating meat. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if, if you can give 50% or 90% of everything you have and you feel like you can afford to do that and you want to do it, then that's fine. And if, if you can give 1% or nothing, you have to give according to your, uh, you know, you don't want to give and, and be resentful about it. And you don't want to give out of obligation because when you give out of obligation, it's not a gift. It's an obligation. Same thing with our salvation. That's why 
you don't, we don't want to put God under our debt saying, look all the things I did, you owe me salvation. That's what Paul was talking about. He says, when you work for something, it's not a gift. Right. And, you know, Brother Luke, uh, another thing that I think about was uh, when Jesus um, confronted the Pharisees and he mentioned how they were gi giving their tithes faithfully, but they lacked, um, you know, the poor, they lacked love. And that's another thing, you know, people can be so focused on faithfully giving their 10% and they, they forget about their heart and the genuineness um, that they should have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Motivation is really matters. Yeah. Praise God. You know, I did not support uh, tithing per se until this year. I um, learned a lot about it through some Bible teachers, namely Joseph Prince. In the New Testament, he brought up the issue of um, tithing, whereby it's something that we don't have to do, we're not commanded to do. Rather, he says it's something we get to do. And he um, points to um, Hebrews, seventh chapter, something that Abraham did even before the law. And he understood the, the law of sowing and reaping, which ultimately, this is all about sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, you will reap if you see if you if you sow you know anger and hatred you're gonna get that right back if you sow love if you sow dollars you, you should get that back Jesus made a good point of this in uh, seventh chapter of Luke 38th verse I think is what it was press down shaken together running over with good measure that you give others will give to you mm -hmm. well yeah but there there's no uh, percentage that we're under we're burdened with. Uh, you, you could give 50% or 10% or 1% or whatever. Uh, the idea is we're, we're supposed to use our free will and our um, to be charitable. And now Paul did raise money for the church in Jerusalem and so there are times where there's like a, a special need where people have to pitch in and raise money to help people who are having a difficult uh, any city. I think in this country we do that a lot too when there's some kind of a disaster. Everybody comes, all the charities come together and, and come to their, their aid. So, uh, and they do that because not because they're required to do it but because they want to help other people. I had, I had, a, I had a one last verse on that tithing. It's Old Testament. It's the last book. It's in Malachi. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the Lord speaking and it's Malachi two no three eight and it says will a man rob God yet he have robbed me but ye say wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings most times we uh, we overlook proper tithing to tithing to the wrong cause and I think that's what he's getting at is that if you're going to give you know the best way to know that you're uh, what you're giving is going to the right cause is you give it to the source itself don't give it to a third party and then depend on them to put it to that that interest put it to that that deed uh, even charities you know you can't uh, you can't really trust who holds your money you know if you give a guy $50 say hey can you give it to that guy you don't you don't know if he's going to give it to him so uh, i think that's what it's just getting at is if you if you're giving that's great but uh, the best way to know that what you're giving to is to give it to the source itself and not somebody else. Yes, yeah, strong, strong. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, this is another example uh, where Paul says uh, that let every man decide these things for themselves and uh, we must be cheerful givers uh, and that all things are permissible but not all things are profitable and as brother Jason said that uh, if you're uh, you reap what you sow if you're generous and helpful to other people then uh, the law of reaping and sowing means that you'll, you'll probably receive blessings uh, but uh, again I don't think that should even be our motivation I know that there there are a lot of uh, giant churches today that are uh, teaching this message of the prosperity uh, if you just have enough faith and you give enough you'll get rich and they're really uh, 
And that to me, that's a very sad state that many of the churches in. It's instead of being in the church so that they can have this relationship with Jesus and and the saints, uh, they're in it to try to get blessings and uh, uh, money. And uh, if you got to give, if you want ten thousand dollars, then you better give a thousand because you're, you're going to get more back. So they, a lot of pastors are really misusing this today, and I really question a lot of these pastors that their what their motivation is Paul said that or Peter I talked about filthy lucre some people are into it for filthy lucre and you can see that clearly in the churches today that it seems to me uh, it's clear-cut that a lot of people are into religion just to make money okay um, and if it, it, you know what if you give Twenty-five dollars to the church of my pocket. I will personally send you a picture of me going to the bank with your money. And if you give me fifty thousand dollars, I will personally bring you to the bank with me as I cash your check. Okay, uh, I got to go find my checkbook. Give me a minute. What about also the fact you, sh you shall be blessed. What about also the fact that it seems to me that it's not just giving to a local church that's giving to God, but what if you're giving a lot of money to help a soup kitchen or a charity like that? Couldn't that be considered tithing as well? Yes, of course. Uh, I wouldn't call it tithing, uh, but again, this is my whole point. Uh, we're not instructed to give a tenth in the, in the church. We're instructed to be cheerful givers, whether it's a tenth or 50% or 1%, whatever you can give, uh, but it, don't give it if you're not going to be cheerful about it. Can't do it grudgingly, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, good point, Luke. I guess it, it isn't considered tithing. We need to just not even, we need to try to block this whole tithing thing out of our head, you know, because I think that confuses people you know we just we need to be generous because we love people and that's it yeah amen it's funny you say that I made a pretty good amount of money in um, 2004 5 and 6 I worked in the banking industry and it was obvious that I was giving a lot of money to a local church and I had some serious disagreements with them and as soon as I stopped giving these large dollar amounts to them, oh boy, that's when they came against me. But not when, you know, that's when the leadership didn't like me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, topic there. Uh, the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus. They believe he took on different bodies and was a spirit. The Watchtower Society's publication, Truth That Leads to Eternal Life, page 52, teaches that Jesus was not given human life again because that would mean he was taking back his ransom. Okay, what's your reaction to that? See, it's stuff like this. That's just, just extremely dangerous. I mean, yeah, people know that I've got a serious problem with the multiple denominations out there, and they're major problems with teaching a mixture of the law or teaching the law and everything and this is this is just outrageous I mean you, you can't it, that's just outrageous I don't nothing else I can say about that well mm -hmm. first of all uh, how did Thomas put his finger in his saw so in his side and in his hands second of all Jesus um, you know he, he did he did uh, come and walk the earth again and Paul says uh, about bodies that we will be given a body and so, you know, it's ridiculous to say that, we, so, okay, our bodies will be, as a matter of fact, we look at Ezekiel where, the, where, where Jesus said, can these bones, these dry bones live? And he rose up these bones to be judged. So it's ridiculous to think, I think, that we're not going to have a resurrection body, um, you know, just from those scriptures alone. And, and you know, so you know, I just think that, they, that what they're doing is it's ridiculous, like he said. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, let's look at a few verses. Uh, uh, Austin, would you look up Hebrews 9, uh, 9 verses 14 and 20? Okay. Uh, and um, Jason, you look up Hebrews 9, 22. Uh, Jackson, you look up Acts uh, 20, 28. 
Uh, Mitch, you look up 1 Corinthians 15.50. Tiffany, you look up Luke 24, verses 36 through 43. And Tanya, you look up John 20, verse 27 and 28. Fifteen fifty. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Hmm. Uh, I don't know how that relates to what we're talking about. Let's go to another one. And my my have, notes on this are not perfect. Sorry. Go ahead. I have uh, Hebrews nine fourteen through twenty. Uh, states, and uh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For which a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the tester. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all, while the tester liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament and dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all people according to the law, he took the blood of calves, and goats with water and scarlet wool and high sop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Okay, you read, I wanted verse 14 and 20. You Did you read 14 through 20? Oh, I, I apologize. Yes, I did, uh, Berlue. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, the, the Christ's blood is the blood of the New Testament, and the idea is that the New Testament begins with the death of the testator. So because Jesus died and his blood was shed, we have this New Testament which began at the cross. Uh, let's go to uh, Jason's verse. I was running out of my kitchen to get some uh, more... Strawberry milkshake, so I missed that. I'm sorry, okay. Luke. <laughs> All right. Jackson, how about your verse? My verse, um, Acts 20, 28 says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay. So he purchased us with his blood, um, that's telling us that the ransom was his shed blood. And so uh, the, they say that the resurrection would have nullified the ransom. But the resurrection doesn't nullify the ransom because it was uh, the, the fact that he shed his blood for us that was the ransom for our sins. Uh, Mitch? Uh, I did read that, but you want me to read it, read it again? Oh, you read yours? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know why that's there. I don't know. That doesn't seem to relate to what we're saying at all. Um, how about uh, Tiffany? Um, you said Luke, 20, Luke 24, and I didn't get those last verses. Uh, Luke of ch chapter 24, verse 36 through 43. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, Tanya though, while we're waiting. All right. I got John 20, verses 27 and 28. It says, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Oh, okay. Very good. So this is the immediate verse that Mitch went went to uh, to point out the resurrection. See, um, the resurrection is what I uh, if if a person without the resurrection we would have no proof that Jesus is God and that He actually succeeded in His uh, plan to die for our sins. 
So this resurrection is the proof that gives us confidence and that justifies us putting our faith in Jesus. And that's the significance of the resurrection. And so this verse here proves that, hey, Jesus proved he's resurrected to Thomas by letting him touch his wounds and his flesh. Um, now let's go to, uh, oh, let's, how about uh, Austin, read John, and look up John 2, verse 19 through 21. And then, uh, Jason, you look up Acts, uh, no, never mind, let me see, Denise is coming flash. Oh. Wait, I apologize, Brother Luke, what was it, John 2, 19 and 20, or? John chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. Okay. And uh, let's go with uh, Jason. You look up 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14 and 17. I have it, Brother Luke. Yeah. Okay, it, uh, it states John 2, 19 through 21. It states, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple being built, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So what what do we learn from this uh, statement or prophecy from Dave about uh, from Jesus? Jesus himself is referring to himself here, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, that's one of his promises. Uh, that's the sign. See, the Jews asked Jesus to give him a sign. In the meantime, he already gave them all these signs by feeding thousands, walking on water, uh, raising people from the dead, giving the blind sight. He did all that. And then they had the nerve to say, give us a sign. And he said he's not going to give them a sign except this sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, and the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and it was talking about his burial and, and resurrection. So Jesus claimed that he would raise himself from the dead in that verse. Now let's go to uh, Acts 224. Uh, Jackson, Jackson, can you look at Acts 224? All right, I've got it. Uh -huh, yeah. Acts 2.24 says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be hidden of it. Okay, when the, when the scriptures refer to God, um, uh, the, the rule is that we think of God the Father. If, we, if it's not referring to God the Father, then, then it would say the Son, or it will say the Holy Spirit. So the default position is God means God the Father. So in this case, it's saying God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Now let's go to, uh, how about uh, Tiffany, could you look up Romans 8.11? Uh, I'm still at Luke. Do you want me to go ahead and um, not read it? Which one did I give you? Luke 24, verses 36 through 46. Uh, no, go to this, look at this one instead, I've already moved on from that point. Okay. Uh, Romans 8.11. I can do mine while she's looking up Romans 8.11. Okay, go ahead, what is yours? First Corinthians, you said 15, 14, yeah, okay. which yeah, 14, is, 17. and Christ is not, okay, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your is also vain. And you said the 17th verse as well, right, Luke? Yeah, 17th. That's a short one, okay. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are not, uh, ye are yet in your sins. Going back to that beginning of that chapter, though, he actually argues with them and saying, hey, guys, are you reprobates? Let me, let me just, if you don't mind, look, I'm, I'm, I'm getting excited about this. Cause no, no, let's not go off on that now, okay, because I want to try to stay on this one point here yeah. to finish this. And that is that this verse is telling us what? 
he rose from the dead. And if you don't, if you don't understand this, then you you're out out, out well, somewhere, this, man. This verse is telling us the significance of the resurrection. Why it's right. so important. And, and that what, started. This whole start argument started in the very beginning of the chapter. He's like, guys, you're not reprobate. That's what he's telling them. So what what is he saying? The importance of the resurrection is there. If you're not, if if there was no resurrection, we're still dead in our sins. That means exactly, Jesus, right. Jesus failed. Everything if if back. Jesus is not raised from the dead, right? Then he didn't pay for our sins, and he's not God. And so therefore, our, you're still our faith in your him sins, is right? useless. He's just saying it's useless to put your faith in Jesus if if he didn't raise himself from the dead, because obviously he's not really God. Then, and he right on, brother, right on. Sins. Yeah. And now, Tiffany, what were you, what was yours? Romans eight eleven. Mm -hmm. It says, "But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you." that he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken in your mortal body by his spirit which, which dwelleth in you. Mm -hmm. So we had three verses here that talked about raising Jesus from the dead. One of them said Jesus raised himself from the dead. Another one said God raised him from the dead. And this one says the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. So isn't that interesting that you have all three persons of the Godhead uh, raising Jesus from the dead. Um, right on, right on. Yeah. And then, of course, we, we there's all kinds of eyewitnesses accounts. I've got probably a dozen verses that we could go to showing the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection. So the idea that the Jehovah Witnesses don't, first, they don't think that, they think that if he, if he was raised from the dead, then it's uh, the ransom wasn't paid. I had someone once tell me the same kind of thing that says, well, why is it such a big deal that Jesus uh, died for our sins if he just was uh, dead for three days? He's, he's raised from the dead. What, that wasn't much of a cost to Jesus. Has anybody ever said that to you? No. <laughs> no one's ever said that? No. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> I, I can't even believe even someone even did say that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it could be a fair argument, but you know. <laughs> to me, that well, that's, person, that's, person making that argument seems like they're just willfully ignorant. Well, right, I think that's, that's basically what the Jehovah the Witnesses right there, yeah, are saying. I, mean, I think the Jehovah Witnesses are making the same kind of a point. They're saying if he's resurrected, then there's no ransom because he's back right. alive. Well, what's exactly. the big deal? He died. He died, but he's back alive. So I don't see that there's any real ransom paid if he's back alive. Exactly. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says he his his blood and his death paid for our sins, and it says that he was physically resurrected. So obviously they can try to use reason and logic all they want, but their their view is not biblical. That's what we're trying to see is if if their doctrine is biblical or not. Right. Okay. Um, now what about? Hmm. Okay. We're. Uh, I, I don't want to bring up another uh, doctrine yet. I think we're getting so close to the end here. Let's have like some like final remarks from everybody here before we end end the, the show. Um, we covered a lot of different doctrines, and, uh, and as we said, if you look at any religion, if I took look at Roman Catholicism, uh, I can find a lot of things that they have right and a lot of things they have wrong, and in Mormonism. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they have some things right. I can't think of anything, uh, and, or Jehovah Witnesses. And but just because so it's a false religion or a cult doesn't mean necessarily that we got to automatically disregard every doctrine they have. But we, if we go through them one at a time, we're finding out that uh, did we find any of their doctrines yet that are biblical? Are there are there any of the doctrines that uh, you learned uh, tonight uh, now would that have surprised you? What about bat water baptism? I know they had a pool at one of their events that I actually attended back in like 2001 or something like that. Huge, huge event. I think I think they're in a water baptism at least. 
<laughs> they they get one of them right, well, you know. They do. They do water baptism, but but you've got to have uh, met all their pre-qualifications before you can get baptized. You've got to take a test. There's 80 questions. You got to I'm well, fine. Thank you very much. Yeah, you got to you got to uh, pass all their pre-qualifications before you can get their baptism. Uh, to me, uh, all I would say is what uh, Philip. What did Philip say to the to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch when he said, "Can I be baptized?" Uh, no, you can't be baptized today. You have to go through a, a, a course, and you have to come back to Jerusalem. And after we're done, we, we may think that you're worthy of baptism, but first you have yeah. to pass a test. Yeah. And the tithe, too. He had to throw down some money before he did that. Yeah. That's Somebody so, the 160 Luke, so I was going to say that when you, when you asked us if there were any biblical doctrines, I was trying to say that would be unlike the times when we haven't had enough time to turn to the passages yet. That would actually be an appropriate time for the crickets. <laughs> Bring on the crickets. Thank you. There okay. Uh, here's what my question is: Can anybody find the verse where Philip is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch and he asks if he can be baptized? Oh no! <laughs> Not a clue, bro. Luke. What's that? I said I I haven't the clue. It's X. Can you try Acts 8 and 26? Yeah, well, if you got it there, read it to us, sister. Okay. It says, uh, I'm not sure if this is it. Um, and now the angel, and now angel, oh, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down to Jerusalem, to Gaza. And this this is desert. So he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and an Enoch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, who had charge over, the, over all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit, uh, sit with him. The place in the scripture he read was this. And so, huh? Hello. Continue, but a little louder. Okay. Um. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shear is silent. I mean, before its shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In in his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the Enoch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and, the beginning, at this, and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the Enoch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to st stand still, and both Philip and the Enoch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when Philip came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So the Enoch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found at Azotus, 
and passing through, he preached in the cities until he came to Gesser. Okay, that, that, that'll be enough right there. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> now, there are some very interesting things that, uh, in that section that she read there. Uh, first of all, the, uh, he was reading from Isaiah and talking about Jesus. Isaiah 53 particularly uh, uh, talks about Jesus and his, his death and his, his uh, pain for our sins. That's Old Testament a description of a prophecy of Jesus uh, dying for our sins. So he's reading that, and then Philip explains it to him, and, and then the, after he explained it to him, he says, is there a reason I can't be baptized now? And he said, well, if you believe with your whole heart, you can. So that was the, the only test. Now, Philip didn't say, well, sit, sit down and fill out this questionnaire. There's 80 questions on it. The only, the only requirement that Philip put on him was that he believed Jesus is the Son of God and what he taught him about Jesus in that session there uh, from Isaiah. So uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the test for someone to get baptized. It's very simple. Uh, if you put your faith in Jesus, the Son of God is, is your Savior. So, uh, yeah, that would answer your question, Jason, about what the uh, JWs think of water baptism. They, we discussed that in an episode before you joined us, I guess. So so if you believe God, it's accredited to you as righteousness? If you believe in the Lord, it's righteousness. Amazing. Yes, it's that simple. Uh, okay, so as there, uh, we're out of time here. Let me ask everybody to just make a short closing uh, remark. Uh, anything you want to kind of summarize what you thought about the show, uh, and, and then say goodbye to anybody who may be watching. Then I'm going to end the broadcast live, but we'll still continue talking among ourselves privately after I close it off, okay? So uh, go ahead. Well, let's start with Brother Austin. Thanks, Brother Luke. Uh, wonderful show tonight. Uh, good, good, strong foundation. Uh, nice to see uh, my brothers and sisters very sound in the uh, just one thing I'm going to leave off tonight is uh, no matter where we are in our life or what we're doing, I, I notice that you know maybe it's a job or maybe it's uh, going a new place or doing something differently that is not necessarily uh, Christian based. Uh, you are the light, and we represent Jesus Christ. So no matter where you are. Or who you're with, or where you go, it's uh, it's okay to show Jesus, you know, because uh, we're out there to win souls, and you know, wherever you are and wherever you do, make sure you shine that light. Uh, let people see the darkness they're in, so they can come out of it. Thank you, guys. Uh, God bless. Okay. Thank you, brother Austin, and, and uh, brother Jason. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I cannot really emphasize this enough. It's like a, a, a world of bondage, not just for the Jehovah's Witnesses, but just anybody who professes Jesus Christ. Obviously, they can't profess him as Lord because they don't believe he is God, but that's another issue. When we get into this whole works-based salvation, it's just it puts the, the emphasis on ourselves and our own self-righteousness and really degrades the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's just creating more bondage, folks. Jesus Christ died so that we could receive his love and he showed us how much he forgot to love the world and that we don't have to work for it. Amen. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brother uh, Jackson. Thank you, Luke, for having me on the show, and I really have appreciated this time of fellowship and education. I would just encourage anyone out there who's questioning Jehovah's Witness doctrine or who um, is, is questioning their beliefs at all to take a look at biblical Christianity and see how it holds up, because I think you'll find it really passes the test. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you for all your good insights, uh, Jackson. Brother Mitch? Yeah, I'd just like to say that, you know, I had a question what I have I believed many times and check into what I believe. I had to challenge myself. I mean, I came from a Catholic background, and I questioned Catholicism. Oh, boy, was I rejected. But you know what? Man wasn't... That my family wasn't what was important. The truth was what was important. The people around me. And then after I questioned that, I also questioned other doctrines. And when I started asking questions and thinking for myself, I wasn't very popular. But when I started to find out the truth about the gospel, that was good news and it set me free, that it has nothing to do with me and I can't mess it up because Jesus did it for me. And I really learned what the gospel meant. It set me free. And if you're seeking to be set free and you're in, in something that you think you're free, you're praising God and you're, and you're glorifying God, but it's not setting you free because it's, not, it's putting a yoke upon you, then look again. Challenge yourself. And if you find the truth, the truth will set you free. And so I encourage you to do that, and I pray that you find that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mitch. And Sister T uh, Tiffany. Um, I just want to say I really enjoyed the discussion tonight. Um, I have learned so much in such a short amount of time. Um, it's truly a blessing. Um, also, I would like to just add, you know, listening to each of the each each person that just spoke. Um, I truly believe everything that you guys spoke on as far as, you know, letting your light shine and um, also with being, being a vessel in faith and um, I too started off strongly on work-based work faith and um, I, I must say that although I confess that I was set free, I lived in total captivity and it was not pleasing, but um, I was very popular among um, the Christians when I was going upon when I was basing it upon my works. But as soon as I detached myself and started trusting in Jesus, I realized that I was not so popular anymore, and I made that sacrifice to follow Him no matter what. And um, it's it's all about the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, and Sister Tanya? I had a great time tonight, and it was good to be here. And um, I learned some stuff, too, like I, I always do on these Bible studies. So um, I look forward to the next one, and see you later. God bless. Okay, okay. very good. Thank you, Sister Tanya. Uh, well, I want to thank all the panelists. I especially want to thank Sister Tiffany. It's her first time joining us, and uh, I, I hope that you're interested and available to join us uh, in the future, too. So it's great to have you with us. But see, I've said this before, uh, but this is worth repeating. The, uh, the, what we're doing in these hangouts here is we're studying together, we're learning together, uh, and some people will watch the videos and they will learn from them too. But what I value most about what we're doing here is the fellowship. And, and we can have fellowship because we have a little group of people here who agree on the most important core doctrines. Jesus is God Almighty. He's not an angel. Uh, J J Jesus um, paid for our sins and now we can be saved by putting our faith in him completely and no religious work is required. Simply trust Jesus as your Savior, and you're saved. Uh, and, and that uh, once we do receive eternal life from Jesus, it's a gift, and he never takes it back. We'll never lose our salvation for any reason. These core beliefs here is what hold us together and allows us to have fellowship. But there's one other important thing. Uh, we discussed numerous topics tonight, and within this little group here, we found that we don't all agree on uh, Bible translations. 
we don't all agree on how to deal with uh, holidays. Uh, we don't all agree on, you know, uh, giving and, and tithing exactly. We, we we heard different opinions on various things, and guess what? Nobody got mad and left. <laughs> Amen. I'm leaving. <laughs> That is truly a blessing. Yeah, that is what is wonderful and that is what is missing in the body today is that uh, people will not allow, uh, hear each other out. I heard a couple of things and I thought were strange and different, you know, but I didn't, I didn't say, hey, uh, get out of the group. I mean, I got a little button I can press right here that anybody gets ejected, right? But even though I didn't necessarily agree with everything that was said, I never ejected anybody. I, I, I just want to hear you out and, and I, I, interesting ideas, even sometimes bizarre ideas. I, we've had some people introduce ideas that I thought were really weird, but it was still interesting. And, mm -hmm. and we still have fellowship. And uh, no one's rejected just because their opinion is different. So. Um, that is what I really value most about this, the ability to have fellowship based on our core beliefs and then the ability to discuss all these things and have these disagreements and still love each other and learn from each other. So that's what I value most. And uh, let me just say that if anybody's watching this now, uh, I just want to give you an invitation to uh, receive eternal life. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. And he loves us so much that he came down from heaven and he became a man named Jesus so that he could die on a cross and pay for our sins. And, and he, he did what he came to do. He went to the cross. He suffered and died. Now our sins are all paid for. Every sin you've ever done in your whole life, every sin that you might do in the future was charged to Jesus on that cross. So now sins are paid in full. Debt is paid in full. There's no sin barrier between man and God today. Uh, the, as, as I said, there's a veil between, in the temple that separated man from God. That veil was torn open when Jesus died on the cross. Now we have access to God, and Jesus wants you to come to him and receive eternal life. Just like this icon here on the, my channel, Jesus is reaching out. He has eternal life. Will you receive it? He'll give it to you. There's no strings attached. You don't have to join a religion. You don't have to become a religious person. You don't have to follow all kinds of religious rules. You simply need to receive G uh, eternal life from Jesus through faith in him. Put your faith completely in Jesus. Uh, understand that there's nothing you can do to work your way to heaven. All of our works fall short of the glory of God. You need to trust the Savior, and he'll give you eternal life. Will you, if you do that, please make a comment. Uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to hear about it. So, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.